Hello friends, today we're going to talk about Hannah Arendt's On Violence. On Violence is actually one of Arendt's lesser known works, but to my mind, it's actually quite an important book. So in this video, we're going to talk about the differences between power and violence. We're going to talk about Arendt's analysis of the history of political thought, where she gets her definition of power. And we're also going to talk about how technology might change the nature of violence in a political context. For my money, the most startling claim that Arendt makes in this work is that power and violence are opposites. It's pretty conventional for us in public discourse and even in political theory to conflate power and violence, to assume that violence is a form of power. When we talk about the most powerful nations in the world, if we're not talking about their economic might, we are certainly talking about their military might. We equate a nation's power with its capacity for violence. So one of the extraordinary things about violence, Arendt says, is that there's actually widespread consensus on what violence is. She says there exists a consensus among political theorists from left to right to the effect that violence is nothing more than the most flagrant manifestation of power. So that is to say we, we typically think of violence as the extreme end of power or the final manifestation of power. And this idea that violence is the extreme form of power, Arendt says we can find that rooted in the history of political thought. She says, at least within the history of Western thought, there is a tradition that equates political power with command or domination. And if we understand political power in this way, it makes a certain degree of sense that violence would be one of the modes in which this power is exercised. However, Arendt argues there is another thread within the history of political thought, an alternative tradition. And within this tradition, we can find an alternative articulation of the relationship between violence and power. And I think Arendt would say it's a more accurate account of that relationship. And she claims we can find this alternative account in the democratic tradition, or maybe the Republican tradition. As she often does, Arendt takes us back to ancient Athens. And she says what we can find in the birthplace of democracy is an image of political power as a collective enterprise. And she connects this to Republican Rome as well. She sees that as another model. What she finds in these regimes is a kind of political power that is contingent upon people's participation. And Arndt believes we can learn from these examples something about the nature of politics and political power itself. All political institutions are manifestations and materializations of power. They petrify and decay as soon as the living power of the people ceases to uphold them. So the picture Arndt paints here is fascinating and I think persuasive. She claims that all political institutions, whether we're talking about a, a Senate or a president or a court, all of these institutions and offices derive their power from the support of the people. And insofar as people no longer support or believe in or respect the authority of particular political institutions, they calcify, they decay they lose their power. So Arendt effectively gives us two theories of government here. On the one hand, there's government by power. And that's really government from the bottom up, in a sense. The many rule, and they use their power. They invest their power in an institution or even an individual who then governs. The alternative is government by violence, and that's really more of a top-down situation where one individual or maybe a few rule over the many. And they use violence as an instrument to enforce obedience or maybe order amongst the people. Now, I think what we see here is Arendt actually modifying and building upon the whole social contract tradition. If you've read Hobbes or Locke or Rousseau, some version of this model sounds pretty familiar. Groups of people getting together, deciding collectively to be governed by a particular institution or person or office. Arendt seems to have something like this model in mind. But I would say there's something also of the Machiavellian tradition in Arendt's formulation. Machiavelli, even in The Prince, which is arguably you know a pretty tyrannical book, seems to recognize that a prince cannot govern without the support of the people. In The Prince, there's a couple passages in chapter 9 that I think are worthy of note here. Machiavelli says, Furthermore, a prince can never secure himself against a hostile people, as they are too many. Against the great, he can secure himself, as they are few. And he goes on to say, Also, the prince always lives of necessity with the same people. But he can well do without the same great person, since he can make and unmake them every day, and take away and give them reputation at his convenience. And lastly, 
But when a prince who founds on the people knows how to command, and is a man full of heart, and with his spirit and his orders keeps the generality of people inspired, he will never find himself deceived by them, and he will see he has laid his foundations well. So I think Arendt is correct that we can find this way of thinking about political power within the history of political thought. We don't have to think about political power in terms of command and obedience, master-slave relationships. So Arendt redefines power as something very specific. Power corresponds to the human ability not just to act, but to act in concert. Power is never the property of an individual. It belongs to a group and remains in existence only so long as the group keeps together. When we say of somebody that he is in power, we actually refer to as being empowered by a certain number of people to act in their name. So according to Arendt's definition of power, there is no such thing as a powerful person. There is only a person who has been invested with power by a group of people. Both power and violence can be used to achieve political goals. In that way, they're alike. But through power, we use speech to reach agreement amongst people and the majority rule to enforce consensus. Now, I think there is an interesting question about tyranny of the majority. What does that look like? Is that an exercise of power? Does that count as an unjust exercise of power? Something to think about. Now, violence allows a small number of people to compel submission, and a minority are able to rule and enforce obedience. So think about a ruling elite. And it's perhaps this most of all, that small groups of people use violence in opposition to the power of larger groups that gives Arendt her sense that the two are opposites. At the very end of part two, Arendt tells us, power and violence are opposites. Where the one rules absolutely, the other is absent. Violence appears where power is in jeopardy, but left to its own course, it ends in power's disappearance. This implies that it is not correct to think of the opposite of violence as nonviolence. To speak of nonviolent power is actually redundant. Violence can destroy power. It is utterly incapable of creating it. Now this is an extraordinary position and maybe something radically new in the history of political thought. Because again, as Arendt says, we typically think of violence as the final arbiter in political disagreements. So we think of government flexing its military muscle or using police force as a demonstration, a manifestation of its power. But Arndt says we need to think about things from the other way around. What we're actually seeing when we see police in riot gear or when we see a military intervention, Arndt argues, is a loss of power. The state is using violence to desperately cling to power that is in jeopardy. When we think of something like a large scale riot, what we're seeing is people withdrawing their support from the power structure. And in response to this loss of power, states sometimes use violence in order to achieve order and obedience. At one point, Arne puts this quite clearly. She says, the loss of power creates a temptation to substitute violence for power. So when we see the state flex its muscle, Arne says, power is in jeopardy. Now I wanna say a word about technology before we close and about new forms of weapons and how that might change the nature of government and government's use of violence. So what for Arendt was only hypothetical, that you might have a single person or a small group of people who would have at their disposal extraordinary technical, technological capacities for violence. That possibility becomes increasingly more real as technology becomes more and more advanced. The idea of a robot army is no longer just the stuff of science fiction that's no longer so far-fetched. And so it is possible in the future that we might have new forms of violent governments, new kinds of government that are able to rule, command very effectively using violence and without popular support. And I think Arendt saw a seed or maybe a shadow of this form of government in totalitarianism, in Nazi Germany, a government of total violence. So that is a threat that we may need to confront as human beings in the future. And the only way I think Arendt would say we can confront it is by acting together, making use of our power. So thanks again, everyone. Talk soon.